Welcome back to my channel. My name is Carly Stevens. This is Carly Stevens Books with all things writing, publishing, and indie author life. And I am so pleased to have Amanda Casey, um, who is also a friend of mine, um, on the channel. So Amanda has been writing stories and illustrating her characters for as long as she can remember. Writing contemporary fantasy that connects people with the natural world is her goal. Creating stories that blend familiar settings with fantasy elements is her passion. Most of her writing combines art, mythology, and ecology. Romance will always hold a special spot for her plots as well, because who doesn't love a story without a good relationship at stake? I hear that. You can find her in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado, where she allows her inner nature child to run wild. She works as both a park interpreter and a children's library associate at her local library, where she shares her imagination and creative programs with the community. When she's not dreaming up new whimsical ideas for stories, she enjoys hiking, backpacking, drumming with her local Tycho group, while keeping her two cats and husband entertained. So welcome, Amanda. <laughs> thank you, Carly. I just want to thank you for having me on your channel. This is awesome. So, and again, I'm also very grateful for um, all of your help in my critique group. I think we have been critiquing each other's work <laughs> for about six years now. Um, you, Debbie and Ed, I can't thank you enough for all of your constructive <laughs> feedback. So I feel very lucky to be here. So thank you. Yeah. Super excited to be here. <laughs> well, I'm definitely yeah. lucky to not only have you on the channel today, but um, that group that we've been a part of critiquing each other's work has been just invaluable for me as well. So this is just a joy to be able to feature you and, you know, um, not only your upcoming work, but also just your passion for nature-based magic systems, which is the, the focus of today's talk. But before we get into that, um, you said in your bio that you've been writing basically for as long as you can remember, but what has been your journey from um, I, I know a lot of us played around with different stories, but how did you get from there to now um, becoming a published writer? So that is a great question. I, I have been writing stories since I was a little kid, but before I began to actually write, I'd say novella length stories, I was illustrating. So I was drawing characters. I love drawing dragons. I love drawing animals. Uh, fantasy would always hold a mega soft spot in my heart when I was in my teenage years. And I thought to myself, why don't I come up with a story for these characters who have these abilities or they're going on these random adventures and they, they're usually going on some kind of quest of some kind. So I wrote my first uh, novella length book, I would say. And this is back in the day when I was playing with Word didn't have Scrivener, didn't have any of the, the tools I have today. I'm and, still playing with Word. <laughs> right? I, I still do too. So I take, I'll oftentimes take drafts and I'll flip it over to Word because I feel like it's my safe spot. Like, okay, if I make a mistake, I can just go to Word and, you know, hash it out and have fun. So I, I wrote this story called Remedies. That was the title. And I don't know where the draft is. It's somewhere in an old laptop somewhere, but it, it involved a young woman who lived in a desert and there was this like kingdom on the side and then there was a an antagonistic root that would come out of the forest and like try to destroy these people that lived in the desert mm -hmm. and so there was this quest where she had to pair up with a group of 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 men from this kingdom and she's like the healer in the group and she had to go and find some kind of way to defeat this root that was apparently ill and so long story short, I just ended that book with a, a romantic note because romance was like not my thing at the time. It is now. I really love it. I love reading it. I love writing it. But it ended on a note where the the man, the romantic interest and the woman characters, they were going to um, get married and go off on this next book. And so that was my first story where I felt like I could keep writing. And that was like a very empowering thing saying you don't have to stop at this story and you can keep writing and in, into this this what you've created so that was super amazing for me um but as far as what keeps me going like what what makes me write and having our critique group as you know I am like way up here with these ideas and I'll bring in something and our lovely critique group will say okay 
let's bring it down a little bit and maybe make it a little more uh, relatable to the reader. So very, very helpful with my ideas being like way up here with nature. But there is this living, breathing, changing thing called nature that I want to know how it remains healthy. Like what are the mechanisms behind it to where it has something called homeostasis? So homeostasis is basically self-regulation. We, we say this in biology for an, an, a, an, a plant or animal to remain healthy. And I'm going, there are so many different ways in which this system could be developed. I don't know how every component in our world and our planet all works together. And so I want to know. And that's that's basically what my quest is with my writing. I think um, that through line is probably the the health related type of situation that fuels my my magic systems and nature. I think it was Stephen King who mentioned once that the books that you write, you might be working on all these different stories, but the one that keeps kind of repeating itself and that theme that kind of keeps poking at you, hey, write about me, write about me. That's what's going to define you. And that's what's going to mm-hmm. eventually need to be written. So that's that's basically what I hope to accomplish with my current writings. So we'll see if it works or not, but that is where I am. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's interesting. This is the first time that I'm hearing about remedies, that early story of yours and it's remarkable how similar thematically it is mm-hmm. to um the parts of some of your current works that I'm reading yeah. so that that's so you've already started to answer this question but what is it that has drawn you so forcefully toward um toward not only nature but also having ma- magic that is nature based um why does that keep drawing you back that uh, that's a really good question it's again this constant search of relationships that kind of come up into my imagination so I'm basically a child in a candy store when I get to explore oh weather patterns like what makes them what what controls them or plate Mm -hmm. tectonics what underlying force living or non-living is making our planet function the way it does. And so one of the components uh, that I have played with, and I guess you could you could call it magic or just a system where there are unknowns that you're trying to answer. And that could deal with maybe a species like a hermit crab. <laughs> There's so this the is... sticker. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Henrietta. I saw a post, the post on uh Instagram I think it was and I was I was so pleased to see Henrietta the hermit crab represented Uh, but but go on no you're fine so this is basically one of the characters in my current book that's coming out and I'm playing with the idea with there being a type of hidden kingdom a fey kingdom that lives alongside us humans that we might see as a current day species but maybe it has a special quirk maybe there's something different and maybe they have some powers that we're not really used to. And I'm just thinking from my biology background, okay, how many species on our planet do we not know of? Well, what if there Mm -hmm. were fae? What if there were fairies? What if there were sprites, familiars, we call them? What if they're just an unidentified species? Or what if a um, a fauna, which means animal, fauna fae, like this little hermit crab, what if she had a strange behavioral quirk? that could drive the plot. And so that's kind of where my magic kind of runs away with my imagination. (laughs) So one of the examples would be when a character notices this character's obsession with the color blue. Well, a normal hermit crab probably isn't going to have that behavioral trait. I I don't know, maybe a biologist has documented that somewhere in, in, in a marine ecosystem. But this is this is what I'm playing with. So I get really excited about the what ifs. Like what if there is a character that's from another kingdom that influences our world in a magical way? That's that's what drives my stories. So relationships. Um, and I thought I would talk uh, or touch on a relationship that I well an experience that I actually drew from um, when I was an intern in Kansas, I was working at a nature center. So this is my college years. And I was not writing fantasy books at the time, but I was still drawing characters and just kind of dreaming up some ideas at the time. And I had this 
there's this predisposition with the fantasy genre that I'm, I'm learning more and more and more about in my current day, um, where we have forces in nature that are good and evil. Okay, so we label them as these forces that a character has to find some kind of balance in whatever world you're creating. And I thought I would illustrate why that actually kind of turns me off about the genre. I know that's not a super popular thing because readers like to read for that. They want to go up against that evil force that maybe there's a dark lord, you have to th overthrow him in some way. And I mean, that that's just like a, a story that keeps retelling itself in fantasy. So I had been an intern in Kansas at a nature center and I'm at the nature center one day and a garter snake had gotten caught in an insect trap, which is basically these little traps are used to prevent roaches, um, insects, spiders from getting into the, the facility and causing all kinds of problems. And so one of the biologists asked me, he said, hey, would you mind doing a video of why snakes are, are important to the ecosystem? Like, why do we actually value them? Okay, so we get the snake out of the insect trap it's okay. It's it's going to be able to go back. It's healthy. It, it hadn't been harmed by it, thankfully. So I get really, really excited. I'm like, oh my gosh, snakes. I absolutely adore them. And I want to like vomit at the world why they're important. So what I start doing is I'm holding the snake and he's taking a video and I'm like, snakes are really, really important. You want to keep them in the, you want to keep them in your backyard. You don't want to get rid of them. You don't want to kill them because they're going to eat things like bugs and spiders and and ticks and I scrunched my face like that and I made my voice different and the feedback I got on that video was okay he said you know that was great we will want to make sure that when you are um portraying any kind of any kind of creature doesn't matter if it's on the bottom of the food chain or if it's up here we want to make sure that when we're talking with the public we use it we um we display our, our, um, or interpret them as being important to levels of the ecosystem. So what I was doing is I was actually kind of demonizing the spider and I was making it less important from this big picture that I had not really understood. And so that, that story sticks in my mind because in that split second, I had so easily condemned a spider as being less important not as important and maybe even to be feared and that as an author wow like your words they're down on paper and your reader mm -hmm. is going to read it and it's you know what I mean it's like it's there and it's it's not going to come it's permanent on on your, your piece of paper so like with with your teaching you probably have the opportunity with your live audience to interact with your students right and I get that with the nature center job that I have at the park that I work at and having that live audience helps me to kind of gauge what I'm dealing with and what they're looking for when we're going on a, a guided hike which I can tell you nobody out of the 20 people in your class or on your hike is going to look at that rock and see it the same way you do so it's really important to just take a step back and really look at that big picture and not jump into good or bad and that compartmentalization for me is like very restrictive and I try I try to do that in my writing so you're not going to find a, a big evil dark lord that my characters are trying to to overcome in some way so I just thought I would share that interesting uh past experience because that for some reason has defined my writing and I hope I hope to portray mm -hmm. writing and characters that way as they move forward so yeah Man, I have I have so many uh, <laughs> thoughts about <laughs> um, what you said. I think I think fantasy is largely moving away from that sort of dark lord um, yeah. split, and you know, not not in the same way or or even perhaps to the same degree. But um, you know, I hope that in my writing too it's more like people can make bad decisions you know mm. or or bad things can happen with some kind of species you know harming someone but to say that that creature or that person is therefore condemned is is uh something that i hope 
I hope most of us want to want to avoid, you know, there's there's um value in in life, you know, and I think right. it's wonderful that you that you have that love even for creatures that are typically reviled. Like I find it I I I I I find it difficult to care for the spider. <laughs> yes. And, and I, I completely understand that there, that's, that's totally fine. There are creatures mm-hmm. that I am not very fond of. Um, and knowing what you're comfortable with is no setting those boundaries, especially when you're creating a fantasy, right? These things could, could, they need to have some kind of conflict. They need to serve, they need to bring the conflict. So there's conflict in the predation of the snake and the spider which the snake is trying to eat. Obviously that's a conflict. That is, that's survival right there. And that I think within a nature-based magic system, whatever you do, get creative, survival at some point should come in into the center of, of your, your theme because hmm. survival is not, there's nothing that's favored. One, one, one species is not favored over the other. And that's the homeostasis. Like how does that health maintain itself? fictional writing is about relationships and that's just my candy right there like could eat that all day (laughs) yeah one of the one of the things that I love just about like you in general there are several but one is is just the your curiosity your genuine curiosity about the natural world and about what magic could kind of dwell in those cracks or what could um overlay the things that we see so it's not so much that you're you tend to impose all that much I mean you you do obviously create some things that are um that are fairly new you know that didn't exist in history or or what have you but um most of it just just lays right on top of everything that already exists so it's it's almost like it just gives you more fodder for that curiosity and for your readers as well to um to kind of see nature in a new light through the different magical um ways that you kind of interpret those things I don't know how how much that made sense but I no, it does. love that I love that curiosity and that love that you have um for nature Thank it makes you. me <laughs> want yeah. to ask some some of the same questions and not just look at a rock and see a rock but um <laughs> kind of think about what what does this mean in a, in a bigger in a bigger sense or what right. what could this mean right that's that's a good point you, you mentioned curiosity and I think that if there's one thing um, the magic system what makes me what makes it so connected to the natural world is having unbridled curiosity that you are willing to say when you don't know something hmm. I don't know how this works well there's your story there there's your plot there's there's all of your little things that you're going to play with and hopefully piece together. It comes with an, I don't know, but I want to know. And so that's, that's a good mm. point. Glad you touched on that. <laughs> yeah. The way that you, now that I'm, this was already kind of related to the next question I was going to ask, but I'm realizing that your process, uh, your organic process of kind of melding nature and magic systems in order to account for things or or find answers or follow that curiosity is a lot like how mythology got started at its very beginnings and so something that is also really prevalent in your writing is that mythological Mm -hmm. element I mean you have a you have a book that is um when this is going live I think it's I think your book will have been out for a few days um blue reflections which has um which has which has mermaids essentially um or at the at the heart of the story so can you talk sure. a little bit more about how mythology works in your magic system in your writing yeah absolutely so there the mythology i look like to look at mythology with what i'm playing with is celtic mythology and to start on my character celia so when i was crafting her i I had a very big problem. Okay. For one, she doesn't know who she is. She has amnesia. So she can only remember past uh, about 10 years of her life. And that's about it. (laughs) And she doesn't know anything prior. She doesn't even know how she began to work at the Louvre. So the Mm -hmm. setting is in France. We're in Paris. We are contemporary. We're in the current day. And she does not 
metamorphose and have a fishtail. So I have this character who has an identity crisis. Okay, so identity crisis is the big, the big like through line with my my, my first book for Celia or first novel. And I'm going, crap, I am in a, I have a problem because how am I going to market this to mermaid readers? They want the <laughs> siren. They want the vengeful I'm going to sink that pirate ship. I'm going to go up mm -hmm. and cause all these problems. And there's usually an arc where the, the siren or mermaid will have to um, overcome some kind of like darkness, inner darkness about her. Celia does not have that. She's actually, um, she's a little bit boring and I'm not going to, I'm not going to shed around the light of that. So she is, she has a lot of issues with identifying. Her identity is just, I identify as a sea nymph. And the scene of terminology came from the Louvre, the setting where she works. And there is, there are sculptures of these beautiful sea nymphs at the Louvre. Mm -hmm. And I, I think you've been there as well. So I've been to the Louvre and I was blown away by some of the marble sculptures there. And this is when I was in college. This was about 11 years ago when I went and I thought, this is, there's so much here. Like, why, why do we, why do we have these women? Why are we portraying them as these beautiful women? who are sea nymphs, who are from the sea, but they're living on land. And this, this comes from a lot of Greek mythology. This is not Greek mythology. This book is not Greek mythology. Okay. So we have a problem there, right? So I'm sitting here going, Celia is not a mermaid. She's not a siren. She has barely any voice. She's very shy and introverted, quite boring as an individual. And, um, she, <laughs> she does not have, um, this metamorphose going on but I know she has a crush on watercolor artists that she meets and he's from Scotland. Okay. And he has this lovely collection of folk tales called the reflections. This is what I'm making up. This is not something you can't go onto Google and find the reflections and find a collection of folk tales. I created this because I wanted to have something to connect her with the mythology and then the magic system that she's attempting to learn what the purpose is which is I'll get into that but anyway the mythology so Damien comes to Paris and he the watercolor brings, artist yes right. watercolor artist and he's like he's pursuing her and he wants her to look at some some paintings that he has currently made um, that are wrapped around this strands of moonlight folktale and there's there's like a little mantra that goes along with it. But Celia learns through Damien, there is a creature called a selkie, a selkie. Okay, so not a mermaid, not a siren, not a sea nymph, but a selkie. And selkie mythology heavily weighs on tragedy. Okay, so selkie mythology, she has no idea what this is. He is going to teach her about it in, in the book as they, they go embark and try to find a fae treasure that will reveal who she is and where she comes from. Her goal is, I want to know who I am. I want to know my identity. And she <laughs> she is just so sucked in with this, this type of folklore situation. And the, the folk tales, okay, they deal with a selkie coming onto land. And when she comes onto land from the sea, she is required to shed her salt skin. This is what identifies her with the ocean. This is her identity. Identity. That is, that's my keyword. That was like, if I could fill the plot hole better in my in my story, it would be right there. The Selkie's identity with the sea and her Selkie salt skin. Now we have a problem. So she's on land. She forgets the ocean. She forgets where she's from. My character situation. And in typical Selkie folklore, the man or a man who, who is pursuing her will find her salt skin, dig it up and capture her into a life on land. Now she's trapped. And this is a very tragic tale. This is something that women can relate to feeling trapped into a relationship with a man. This is something that a lot of women can relate to. I didn't write that. I did not want to write that story. I didn't want to write a tragedy between my love interest and my my selkie okay <laughs> so what i did and what a lot of uh, fantasy or mermaid or um fairy tale retellings will do a lot of authors will do this they will take 
the folk to- the folklore or the-, the folk tale and they'll twist it and sometimes they'll say well what if what if the villain survived or mm-hmm. what if so-and-so died and the other one got away and right so that's the part world- of the part of the fun how are you going right. to twist the you know take the elements and then remix them mm-hmm. exactly and I know I know you've had fun doing this um with with some of your writing and and with Hamlet your Hamlet retellings is super fun it, like it's like what fuels our imagination when we get into this writing zone so all I did was turned I turned the the tragic kind of folktale into a healing one Hmm. so I basically just said okay so we're gonna have the folktale and it basically is going to correlate with the art or the magic I call it the art of salt trance but it's a magic system that Celia is trying to master and um so when Damien sh- shares this folklore with her, it, there's a mantra. And I, I try to encourage people when they're creating whatever kind of magic system they're coming up with. So they, I have these little bottles that symbolize these three different components oh, within the those. magic system. Yeah. Um, the magic system is called salt trancing. And Celia is given three bottles from another sea nymph, and she is told to use them to find a fae treasure. She's told, she, she doesn't know what to do. So she's literally like, do I mix them? Do I like put them together? Do I, this is a tangible thing. So this is something I wanted my readers to go, okay, well, she has these bottles and they're named breath, memory, and salt. So when you're kind of creating those ingredients, I want to be able to have a visceral reaction. I want the reader to go, okay, I can breathe. I can feel my breath, my memories. I can reflect on them and have emotions and then salt I can taste. So that was rewritten about a thousand times before I came down to those, those three ingredients and the folk tale, how it ties in with Damien's strands of moonlight folk tale is it's breath of my body memory of my heart salt from my soul with these three strands of moonlight I wish to make you whole and so that's supposed to bring them together and it it took so many rewrites for me to get to that point that component it was the selkie folklore like you said you were asking about the the mythology that is really what married these two characters together um I would encourage people to take time to kind of step away from their draft and look at what those unseen connections are. And so tangibility, Mm -hmm. like bottles, right? These are little bottles full of salt extracts and they're from an ocean apothecary, but how does it connect with this folklore and this folktale? And that's what brings the two characters together. So that was was a lot of trial and error. (laughs) Yes. So it's, it's a lot, it sounds like it's a lot about really meditating on the relationships between Mm -hmm. um, the story that you are telling since yours is mythologically based, considering that, that original piece of folklore, and then how can you make your magic system and, and your characters and nature really all work together in a way that's, that's visible in a way to to the reader um so is that a fair kind of yes, <laughs> summary yes. of of the, the big picture there I would say so and having the ingredients you might be given a tool to try and track down a fake treasure that should show me who I am and where I come from mm-hmm. but how do I piece these together so I know one of one of the three is memory and I'm missing my memory I know that I can breathe above water but maybe not when I'm swimming or when I'm within one of these salt trances and then the salt in the story is supposed to have more of the magical like there's an artifact called a salt trancing talisman and it it holds memories with it preserves memories within it and so I was thinking back and forth how I can use those three principles to kind of Mm -hmm. weave in the story And I forgot to mention that there was a fourth bottle given to Celia, which is called the Silky Salt Skin. And this is the one that is the fourth mystery bottle. Like, what does it do? What's its purpose? And how is it going to 
to give my character more um, more imagery and understanding of this art that will supposedly help her remember where she comes from and connect her with the sea. So I needed something that specifically highlighted selkie salt skin identity. And so I wanted mm. to have that that name within one of the ingredients. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 fascinating. I didn't know that you had those little bottles at home. Yeah. I've seen some of your illustrations. And if you have not checked out Amanda's um work yet you need to you need to just just look at it for the illustrations and then you can make up your own mind but they are absolutely gorgeous it makes it so much easier to picture some of the really complex like you said um yeah. ideas that you are trying to crystallize into a way that that many people can can follow and be invested in right. i would push back against your description of celia as initially boring I mean she's a bit of a blank slate just because she, she has is. that am amnesia <laughs> issue but I I think that makes her a nice um a conduit's not quite the right word but something like that is for the reader to to learn all these things along with her and kind of fall in love with her and uh, I think it's yeah. I, I don't think it's a negative thing at all so uh just yeah. the last last question that I have about your your work and your process is what is it that you hope your audience gets out of your work you have these hefty themes you have some pretty intense natural magic going on what is the the takeaway or if you could choose just one or two for the audience sure so I would say because I love reading stories where you have secondary characters that don't have a voice, maybe they have a strange quirk. Pay attention to those secondary characters. Don't just focus on the main character's journey. I mean, it's we do immerse ourselves in that main point of view, whatever however many points of view you have. But I have get, gotten really good feedback from readers about this character, Henrietta. She does not talk. She is she is literally as curious about this fey treasure and tracking it down even more than Celia is. And so if there's something that when you're going on a walk at a park or if there's there's something that you're overlooking and you just want to know more of, I would say mm -hmm. stop and pay attention because when you're writing mysteries and you're trying to solve something, it's often the little tiny influences that push you forward it's not always this the death of someone or it's not this um this i don't know initiation that this, this we oftentimes get these huge plot ideas right but we're not paying attention to those tiny 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 little pieces that make the story magical and so when i say mm -hmm. my magic is nature-based i'm saying these tiny little relationships that kind of push you forward and egg you forward um before you fear it and seek to understand it. So that is something that will always be one of my personal mantras when I'm talking to people about nature, when I'm at the library, reading to kids. I mean, just take the time to observe and understand before you fear. Because when we get into that fearful mindset, it becomes our our character journey is is lacking. I mean, we 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 pull back and we disengage. And then we're not happy. We are, we're in this little isolated shell. And ironically, we have a character who's the hermit crab who needs to come out of her, her shell to do all these things. So find, find the irony. <laughs> and I'm a very, I'm a very hu humorous person. I laugh at everything. I am always looking to laugh. If I can't laugh, even when I'm reading a very sad story, I, I feel like I'm missing out. So I want to find mm. something that there's going to be a little bit of comic relief in there. And I think those secondary characters can really provide that for us. So that's what I would hope um, people would take out of my writing, hopefully. Well, I think I think that's beautiful, not only for characters, but just for people in general to to remember to seek to understand something before you you fear it and turn it into this antagonist. I mean, what a what a mm -hmm. timely <laughs> important thing for for all of us to get better at and better at, hopefully. Yeah. Um, so how can people find you and your work online? Sure. So I am currently going to be only, I'm only going to have the ebook format 
on Kindle Unlimited. And I'm going to try that out. This is my first time actually using it. For so Blue Reflections? The... the Yes, yes. Okay. Blue Reflections is um, Kindle Unlimited on Amazon. And then the paperback, um, I currently, well, by the time this video comes out, it, the book will be released. So paperback, you will be able to find basically um, anywhere. So because you don't have to keep your book on Amazon's um, Kindle Unlimited program if it's uh, paperback just for the ebook. And then I'm doing a slow release with the hardcover because I wanted to have some fun artwork, fey artwork on the back and some quotes maybe. So oh, I'm fun. not going to rush that. Yeah. yeah. So like here's, yeah, a, here's a map <laughs> that Amanda did just as a little teaser. <laughs> so that map will be in the paperback and the hardcover version. And Ooh. yes, so, and I'll be doing some giveaways all summer. So try to give some free books away and some giveaways for the art. So it's been super fun. I'm learning a lot about what I wanna do with the series moving forward and hopefully to help it gain some momentum. Um, but yeah, it'll be it'll be out there. I'm super excited. <laughs> it's kind Is of- Is there any place where people can follow you like social media or anything like that? Yeah, I am. Well, my website, it's amandacaseybooks.com. Um, and I, I actually cross all, all of my social media. So my in Instagram is amandacaseybooks. My TikTok is amandacaseybooks. Um, I don't have a Twitter. I just have my website. Oh, Facebook. I have a Facebook page, Amanda Casey Books. That's how you would follow me on all of those platforms. So TikTok, Instagram, um, Facebook, and then my website. That's what I have. Perfect. And I'll put those links down below so you can check Amanda out on social media and you can take a look at Blue Reflections. <laughs> it is uh, just a, a beautiful, it, it's a beautiful cover. I've read parts of it. I have not read the whole thing front to back yet, but the pieces that I've seen um, just, just have these wonderful moments. I would definitely recommend if what Amanda talked about today sounds like it is your cup of tea run out and get this this book by Amanda. Um, thank you so much for joining me. This has been delightful. Um, like this video if you like it and make sure to subscribe for more things writing, publishing, and indie author life. See you next week. Bye. Thank you, Carly. Thanks.